Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It is Friday. It is a week until Christmas. I have no idea how that happened. I mean, I know how that happened, obviously, but dang, this month has gone fast. And I am so unprepared for Christmas, it is not even funny. I know it's coming. I've known it's coming. I I thought I had a plan, but I clearly did not. So I am very, very behind and I'm gonna just uh, go with the liturgical understanding of the 12 days of Christmas, which means starting on Christmas Day and going until January 5th, because January 6th is Epiphany. That's uh, what the actual 12 days of Christmas are. And I'm gonna shoot for getting everybody's presents to them in the season of Christmas and not by the day of Christmas. That might not even happen. I hope you're December is going better than mine in terms of planning, but uh, it, it, it'll it'll all work out. It will be what it what it is when when it happens, and my family knows the craziness that's going on, and I um and they are thankfully very kind and and forgiving and accepting of my poor planning this year. Anyway, let's talk about books. Let's talk to an author. Uh, today I am speaking with author Lori McMullen about her novel, Among the Beautiful Beasts. It is historical fiction. It is about um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. So here's the back of the book. Set in the early 1900s, this is the untold story of the early life of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, known in her later years as a tireless activist for the Florida Everglades. After a childhood spent in New England, estranged from her father and bewildered by a mother who gradually fades into madness, Marjorie marries a swindler 30 years her senior. The marriage nearly destroys her, but Marjorie finds the courage to move to Miami where she is reunited with her father and begins a new life as a journalist in that bustling, booming frontier town. Buoyed by a growing sense of independence and an affair with a rival journalist, Marjorie embraces a life lived at the intersection of the untamed Everglades and the rapacious urban development that threatens it. But when the demands of a man once again begin to swallow her own desires and dreams, she sees herself in the vulnerable, inimitable Everglades and is forced to decide whether to commit to a life of subjugation or leap into the wild unknown. Told in chapters that alternate between an urgent midnight chase through the wetlands and an extensive and extensive narrative flashbacks, Among the Beautiful Beasts is at once suspenseful and deeply reflective. So that is the description uh, from the back of Among the Beautiful Beasts. And have you what what do you know about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? I'm I'm curious how many people have heard of her. I knew the name. I don't know that I could have told you anything about her before I started reading this book. I, I guess I had heard the name, but I'd never really done much uh, much reading about her or studying about her. And so this was fun to get to know a person that uh, I didn't really know that much about. I've mentioned before that I was a history major in college with a women's studies minor, and this this type of reading is really the type of history that I enjoy most. That social history, learning about the lives of of women especially and, and their stories that may or may not be told. And I know this is historical fiction, but uh, you still get, you get, you get the, um, you can take the bones of the, the facts of the story and, and learn about Marjorie. And of course, then Lori takes those bare bones and, and fleshes them out into this, this beautiful story about her early life. And so obviously you can't say, yes, I read this book and every, every conversation on the page is exactly true, but you can take the, again, you can take those, 
those basic facts. And Lori said that she read Marjorie's autobiography and got a, a lot of her basic facts from that. So that's something to look into if you are interested in learning more about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. But if you're interested in historical fiction, and if you're interested in especially in women's historical fiction, then this might be a book for you to check out. If you're not familiar with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, maybe you're not as familiar with the um, the history of the Everglades or, or anything about the Everglades. What struck me in this is that this is the early 1900s. And I realized, and one thing, that's that's not that far ago, long ago, right? It's 121 years, obviously, if we're talking about 1900, almost 22. But um, Miami being a frontier town, I just, it took me a while to wrap my brain around that because you know, I think of Miami, you know, it's in Florida, it's on the East Coast. So I think of it as, as, as more developed than I think of as some of the, the Western parts of the, the country where I'm from. But yeah, it took me a minute. Like, I just don't think of Florida as frontier. <laughs> but but Lori does a really good job of describing how uh, Miami was in those early days and how it was starting to develop and be developed and some of the craziness that happened around that development. So let's go ahead and get to the interview with Lori so you can hear more about this novel from her her perspective. Again, it is called Among the Beautiful Beasts. Hi, Lori. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here. I am excited to talk about your new book. It's called Among the Beautiful Beasts. But before we do that, if you could share a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm Lori McMullen. Um, I live in Chicago with my husband and three daughters and two dogs. Um, I grew up in Miami, Florida, and uh, went up to New Hampshire for college and then went to Harvard Law School. I practiced law for a little while and decided that what I really truly wanted was to write, which is what I had always wanted to do and never thought it was actually a career choice. Um, So I had avoided it until I finally just decided it was time. And um, yeah, so I've been writing fiction and raising my family in Chicago. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the dogs so they don't have to be you know, offended <laughs> that you left them out of the family description. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so again, the book is called Among the Beautiful Beasts. It's historical fiction. Can you give an overview of the story? Sure. Okay. So the book is about um, the environmentalist Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who is most known for her advocacy and protection of the Florida Everglades. Um, She lived to be a 108. She died in 1998. And most of what people know about her is her activism that took place later in her life. Um, The work she did with the Everglades was really a, a second half of her life endeavor. So what my book is, is an exploration of her early life and her childhood and her young adulthood and her, um, you know, early years of of marriage and um, kind of exploring who she was and what happened in her life to compel her to care so much about the Everglades and to take such personal risks to defend it. Um, And so my story ends where her more well-known advocacy begins. And it's really a a look at at who she was as a person and how she got to um, be such a well-known figure for the Everglades. And you said that you grew up in Miami, so I'm assuming that you probably, she was kind of um, present in your education in some ways. Um, Yes, for sure. You know, um, in elementary school, I can remember having Florida studies classes, and she is a name that always came up. And, you know, again, we, we learned about the amazing work she did to protect and preserve the Everglades. Um, her most well-known work of writing was um, River of Grass. She's actually the one who coined the term the River of Grass for the Everglades. And, um, you know, as we went on a camping trip in, in sixth grade in elementary school out to the Everglades, we talked a lot about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas then. There are streets named after her and buildings named after her. So she was this presence and I kind of had a vague idea of why she was important to South Florida. But it wasn't until I really started um, doing some research to learn about her life um, that I understood just how much of an impact she had on South Florida and um, the environment's well-being. Mm-hmm. 
And so what was your then initial inspiration or jumping off point to uh, for writing this book? Okay, so this is kind of, I think it's interesting. Um, it kind of happened uh, from two different directions and two different things kind of merged to bring me to a place where I knew this was the book I wanted to write. So the first thing is I had been writing a bunch of short stories um, and I found that in the short story writing, I loved to write about Florida. I mean, I haven't lived in Florida in about 25 years or so. Um, so, but I found that my writing kept bringing me back there and I loved describing places in Florida. And I found such joy in really creating these lush settings and landscapes. So I knew that when I started to write a book, I wanted to base it in Florida. I wanted to set it in Florida so that I could really indulge that love of writing about um, place and setting. Um, and then at the same time, I had just finished reading Circling the Sun by Paula McLean, which is a story of Beryl Markham, who's the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. And I was so inspired by the, the story and, and the idea of writing about a not particularly well-known woman who did this really awesome thing, not as the wife of a famous person or, you know, the daughter of a famous person, but like a really cool thing in and of herself and her own um, abilities. And when I thought about, well, who's a woman I could write about? from the depths of my brain and my childhood elementary education, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas popped into my head. And when I began to do some research about her early life, I realized that she's an incredibly interesting person and that I had really hit upon the thing I needed to write. Yeah, she kind of did the opposite of what you did. She um, uh, grew up in the, in the Northeast and then moved to, moved to Florida. So she, she had the opposite yes. path. <laughs> um, exactly. Exactly. She took the warmer <laughs> path, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now that you know a little bit more about the inspiration behind Among the Beautiful Beasts, let's go ahead and take our first break. When we come back, Lori will be talking more about Marjorie as a character. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. My guest today is author Lori McMullen. We are talking about her historical fiction novel, Among the Beautiful Beasts. So can you talk a little bit more about Marjorie? And uh, so this is historical fiction. So it's, it's a fictionalized version of her early life. So talk about her as, as a character and what about her you think will resonate with readers. Sure. Um, you know, I think... What resonated for me and what I think will resonate for readers is that she was a very normal person with, you know, um, insecurities and doubts and, in, you know, a decent amount of trauma in her childhood and early life. Her, her father abandoned her and her mother. Um, her mother had a mental breakdown and ended up in an institution. Um, she, there was a lot of pressure on her, even as a child to care for her mother and to fix the family. Um, as she got older, she, she married a um, kind of unsavory character who was 30 years older than her. And that was a, a traumatic event in her life. It did not end well. And, um, you know, she is a woman who it's not, it's not like she was born an advocate and was laser focused on what she wanted to do with her life. She took a lot of wrong turns and learned from them. And, um, you know, that's personally what I related to this ability to be okay with making mistakes, 
and bad choices and then figuring out what that means for you and how can how can it be better and how can you find the bravery to make the choice that maybe you think you you know you need to make but it's it's a risky one and where do you find the courage to do that um i think that's a source of inspiration for me i think of a source of inspiration for readers um she's a very interesting woman um so I agree. And, and she um, she went to Wellesley. She uh, yeah, she made some some interesting choices. But don't we all? <laughs> um, but, right, right, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, and then I, I would assume that because of the time period and because of who Marjorie is uh, in terms of being a writer, that you had at least uh, a few letters and things like that for source materials. Yes. So source materials was pretty fun because, um, you know, she was a writer. She'd always loved to write. And when she eventually moved down to Florida, her father was the editor of the Miami Herald. Um, it was a you know newborn newspaper and her father was the editor. And she, uh, when she moved down there, he gave her a job writing first for the society pages of the newspaper. And then she was given more editorial work and more news reporting. Um, and so I was actually able to find, you know, archived issues of the Miami Herald with her writing in it. And there were, there are pieces about her writing. Um, the University of Miami has uh, an archive of material that I was able to look through online actually and find, um, you know, stuff written about the Miami Herald at that time, about Marjorie's editorials at that time. Um, and then the most important and significant uh, resource for me was actually her autobiography called Voice of the River, which was fascinating to me because she's such a rich writer. I mean, if you read River of Grass, which is her seminal work about the Everglades, it is beautiful language and just like lush and gorgeously written. And her autobiography is very factual. It was very um, chronologically ordered and extremely factual with not a lot of um, robust writing. And so that was a great resource for me because it gave me the facts I needed, but that's it. And I was able to take those facts and turn it into fiction and, um, you know, just stay true to her character and her story, but use her own words and embellish um, the narrative. So talk a little bit more about um, fictionalizing uh, an actual historical person. Uh, I feel like I'm going to project here a little bit because I would just, <laughs> I would overthink it to death. So how do you take what you know about a person and then kind of fill in those gaps? Well, I mean, I think it, it was, as a fiction writer, it was really a lot of fun because it was like the character, what the bones of the character was there for me. And then I could imagine, I could use the fiction writer's imagination and creativity to what, what would it have been like to be, to be a little girl in Massachusetts at the turn of the century and take this information. Um, you know, she was scared and alone when her father left and her mother was institutionalized. And, you know, that's, I think anyone with a little bit of empathy and imagination can put themselves in that space and, and fill out the character, make the character um, come alive in a way that was not available in her autobiography. Um, and, you know, I did, as I went through this process, wonder sometimes, like, am I doing Marjorie Justice? Am I staying true to who she was as a person? And the way I dealt with that was I would stop every once in a while, usually at the end of a chapter, and go through it and ask myself, given what I know about her, given what I know about her perspective from her writings later in life, does this seem true? Could it be true? It's not. I know it's not because I made it up. But could it have been? Would she have would she agree with what I just wrote? And I tried to use that as kind of a guiding principle. Um, I'll never know what she, if she would agree that it was um, a, a fair portrayal, but as an artist, um, I think that I tried to balance the creativity with um, the facts and the truth that I knew. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then did, what other types of research did you do? Uh, you know, you, you did, um, you looked up some of her writings and read her autobiography, uh, excuse me, autobiography. What other types of research did you do for the book? Well, I did some um, non-Marjorie specific research. You know, I read some firsthand accounts of, um, they were called gladesmen, these kind of explorers who would go out into the Everglades in the uh, early 1900s. Um, and so I read some of their writings and books about them just to get a sense of what the land was like and what Miami was like at the time. Um, I, you know, I also, I looked back through photo archives of Miami, which was fascinating to me. I mean, at the time Marjorie moved there in 1915, Miami was still considered a bit of a frontier town. So I was able to look at old maps and um, old newspapers and, and archived very bad photographs. <laughs> um, and it looks nothing like the Miami that I know, which is just fascinating to see how it changed. Um, there was a lot written about the land boom in Miami in the 1920s, which is also a time period that takes place in the book. Um, and that was just interesting because that, that's one of the central tensions in the book is the wilderness of the Everglades budding a up against the development of Miami as a city. And so there were actually, you know, a lot of uh, books that I could find addressing the land boom and um, that kind of the attitude towards the Everglades, that it was just there for the taking and that developers, whoever could get it fastest, you know, all the Everglades needed to be was filled in, drained, dredged, and built upon. That was really, you know, the mindset of a lot of, um, people in South Florida at the time. Um, and you could see in old magazines, um, there would just be ads for land in the Everglades at the time. So that kind of firsthand um, perspective on what was going on in the city at um, the time of the, the book takes place was really helpful to me um, and kind of gave me a sense of the city in a way that I hope informs the book and makes the makes it feel um, alive and and understandable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely that definitely comes across in the book. Uh, it's it's I don't, I'm trying to I'm blanking on how I want to phrase this, but it's 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 kind of hard to read from a, a modern more modern perspective because we do recognize you know the effects on the environment and you kind of want to just right. yell at people in the book <laughs> stop it <laughs> yes well i mean one thing that i learned that i had never known was when carl fisher built miami beach he literally built miami beach it had been a sandbar off yeah. the road, and he literally dredged um sand up from the bottom of biscayne bay he dredged the Everglades and brought topsoil from the Everglades to Miami Beach. And Miami Beach is actually kind of an artificial man-made um, strip of land um, that had just started to be developed when Marjorie lived, moved down there, um, which I hadn't really, I grew up there and I had not really appreciated that uh, source of, <laughs> you know, where Miami Beach came from. Yeah, that's, that's crazy that, um, to go to that that's a lot of work first of all <laughs> but, um, uh, right. yeah I was fascinated with that as, as well in terms of character development um how how developed do you like your characters to be before you start writing how much do they develop as you write and I know that might be a little bit different when you're writing historical fiction but how does that usually work for you right you know, I've always wanted to be one of those writers who can say, my character revealed herself to me as I wrote it. But, I, you know, if I'm being honest, that's not how it works for me. Like, I wish it did, but it just doesn't. I do a lot of planning and um, outlining and um, before I even start writing. And the same is true with the character development. I do a lot of, um, sometimes I will write diary entries that never, you know, they're not part of the book. They don't become part of the story, but I imagine that I'm the character and I'm writing as the character and I just write diary entries. What would this character have thought on any given Thursday and uh, as she writes about her day? Um, I, and sometimes I'm not a particularly good artist, but sometimes I will try to draw a picture of what I think the character would look like. Um, I write 
birthdays and, and milestones in their life, even if they, that information is never going to make it into the story, I like to have a good understanding of the arc of the person's life. Um, so I will say that by the time I actually sit down and start writing the story, to me, the character feels fully formed. Um, I, I try to stay open to change because I, I do think, you know, as I write, there is, of course, the possibility that uh, the character will, will develop in a way I didn't expect, or the story will take us someplace I had to anticipate it, and I have to really rethink how the character might react there. Um, but in general, I like to go into it. I like to start um, from a very fully formed place. Time for our second break of the podcast. When we return, Lori and I will be talking more about another character in the book. Kind of a love interest. Well, well, we'll talk more about that. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Laurie McMullen. We are talking about Among the Beautiful Beasts, which is historical fiction about the life of the early life of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Let's return to that interview. And then um, I wanted to ask about another character in the book, um, the character of Andy. And I don't want to give a lot away about what happens with that relationship, but um, I did a little bit of reading after I finished the book, just a little bit of reading about Marjorie, just, uh, yeah. just, just, just to learn a little more about her because I didn't grow up in Miami. So I didn't know right. a lot. And the, what I, there, there's like a, in what I read, there was this sort of passing mention of who I assume is Andy. Um, so how much did you know about Andy? How much did you kind of fill in the blanks? Can you talk a little bit more about that relationship? Sure. I will say I had to fill in a lot of blanks about Andy. It was hard to find information about him. She writes about him in her autobiography, and she says that he wrote for a rival newspaper, The Metropolitan. Um, It was very, very hard for me to find any information about him. So he is, um, I would say, more invented um, than most of the other characters in the book. Um, The factual basis that I had for him really came almost entirely from Marjorie's autobiography and what she said about him. Um, So he really is, I I had to kind of out of necessity, (laughs) take a lot of um, artistic license with him. Um, But that said, I did try to stay true to the things Marjorie did say about him. Um, And a lot of um, what is in there is based on um, the details she shared about him. And, and most particularly and importantly, how much she loved him and really cared about him. I mean, he was the love of her life, um, according to her. (laughs) Uh, So that part was absolutely true. That's interesting that that, that, that according to her, he was the love of her life, but there's not that much information about him. Uh, So I can, I can, I can definitely see where she's a lot more factual in her autobiography (laughs) just from talking to you. And then there was this dude, I loved him at the end, (laughs) you know, Um, what is it about historical fiction that draws you to writing in the genre? 
that's a great question. I mean, I, I think it's really a great merging of the writer's ability to invent a world with fact-based events. I mean, I, as much as I didn't want to practice law, I am a lawyer by training and there is an element of my brain that is very much um, based in, in orderly thinking and established facts. And that kind of, that I think that's part of why historical fiction appeals to me so much because I'm able to be the creative writer and a little bit of the, um, you know, very uh, orderly lawyer put those two things together, do research, but come up with a story. It's, it's kind of like my left and right brain working at their best selves together. Um, and I feel like historical fiction is the result of that. Um, I also think, you know, beyond my own writing preferences, I think there's such an important place for historical fiction. Um, you know, I, my own experience seems to be that people are either nonfiction readers or fiction readers, and maybe they cross over sometimes, but there are so many really interesting, important uh, historical figures that fiction readers might not otherwise find out about. And so I think historical fiction is really kind of does a service to um, readers in uh, exposing people to historical figures they might not otherwise have come across or had an interest in learning about. I agree with that assessment that it, it, it exposes people to historical figures that they might not have heard about. Also, uh, when I talk to people, I was a history major in undergrad, and okay. when I talk to people about being a history major, they're just horrified. They're, they, they see history <laughs> as this boring, awful, it, and it can be, you know, there are textbooks that just are mind-numbingly awful, but it, if if people were to start reading, you know, like something like your book, they could learn about a figure that maybe then would encourage them to read nonfiction or something more historic, right. mis- more historical. So uh, I appreciate what you said in that regard. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think as, as a histor- historian, you would know, right. I, there's so much to be learned from the past. And I mean, I think although this book takes place in the early 1900s and it's about a woman who you know, work to make the Everglades become a national park. So much of this story is relevant now when we talk about climate change and we talk about the importance of preserving um, delicate environments and, and the interconnectedness of urban environments with the wilderness that surrounds them. I mean, it, it, I think that although this is a story about a specific woman in a specific point in time in a specific place, I think there's a lot of generalizations about today's climate issues and the need to advocate for the earth that can, you know, be just as salient now as they were at the, at Bargery's time. And there is, a, it's, it's just a couple of pages maybe, but um, Marjorie and a, a friend of hers actually get the Spanish flu in 1918. And so even though it's not a huge <laughs> part of the book, I'm like, oh my gosh, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> so, completely. There's always yeah. things that are still relatable in, in yes. historical fiction. I have a, a, somewhat of a random question. Um, Marjorie's trousers. Can we talk about? Can we talk sure. about the, the pants she buys in Paris? Sure. Just because um, it's you know it's nineteen, it's not nineteen, 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 twenty around there at that time yeah. that she buys them. Uh, did she actually have these pants, or did you did you them up? Because not a lot of women wore pants then. I invented the pants, but <laughs> because I it, they were invented because of things she did say in her autobiography. So. At that time, when she was finishing her work for the Red Cross in Paris, um, she was debating whether or not to go back to Florida. There was a coworker she had at at the Red Cross who was romantically interested in her, and she was considering that. And there was a lot of, based on the information she shared in her autobiography, I think she was asking a lot of questions about what it means to be a woman at that time. And, you know, she had just gone to Europe by herself and done some very hard work on her own. Um, She was contemplating what it might mean to be married, what that would look like. And she, you know, admittedly couldn't see past a few years of marriage. She didn't, she was 
wondering. She thought she probably didn't want children, but it seemed like she wasn't even sure she was allowed to ask that question, if, whether or not she wanted children. So she, at that time in her life, she really was asking a lot of questions about what comes next. Who am I as a woman? Who am I as a journalist? What would it mean to be a wife? What would it mean to be a mother? And so I put the pants in there to kind of hold all of those questions in one very visible place that she's going to put these pants on and she's going to wear them out in Paris and see what happens. And how does that make her feel? How do people look at her? Um, so to me, the pants were a symbol for these kind of larger questions about feminism that she was grappling with at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I just, uh, it was, you know, it's not a huge part of the book, but it, it sort of captured my attention. And I was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you caught that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on right now? So I have um, started another book. I am admittedly not very far into it. Um, it takes place in Florida. It is not historical fiction, unless you count the 1980s historical. Um, <laughs> it's it's a, about a friendship of two girls in a very unlikely scenario. Um, and it starts out when they're kids in the 80s and it follows them through their adulthood. Um, I don't really want to say too much more about it because it is so unwritten and, <laughs> and fresh, but there are ghosts and there, um, it, it is my intention is it for it to be an allegory for larger, larger societal questions, but at the same time be a very readable story about what friendship means and what happens to those friends that we lose along the way. Those relationships that feel unfinished and don't have closure. How does that affect your life as you grow up and move on and have other relationships? So, but I, Again, like it take, it's going to take place in Florida and um, already, you know, it's, I'm only a few dozen pages into it, but I already know that the setting and the location is going to be important again. Um, I think that's just something that's important to me. So, Well, I can only imagine Florida, uh, Miami in the 80s. Is it Miami again? It's not. It's actually okay. going to be further, further north okay. um, in, in, in North Florida. Yeah. But still, Florida in the 80s, the uh, the fashion alone it could <laughs> be way too fun to research. Exactly. <laughs> and considering that a lot of the younger people that I work with consider anything before 2000 basically the ancient <laughs> history. Yeah, it's, it's historical fiction, it's unfortunately. Historical fiction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, I'll take that. We're old, what can we say? <laughs> yeah. Right. It's time for the final break of the podcast, but yeah, really, I've had this conversation multiple times. Anything before 2000 is just considered irrelevant or or just way too old to be of concern. I find this fascinating. And I also think it's hilarious. There's a a trend on TikTok where there's a, a sound that someone says to the older generation of TikTok, meaning those born in the late 90s or something like that. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Uh, See, I can't even form sentences, but uh, hey, if you're old like me, congrats. Let's go ahead and take that final break of the podcast. And when we come back, the conclusion of my interview with Lori. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Lori McMullen. 
you mentioned that you are um, a lawyer by training, but then, and you never really thought writing was a possibility. So how did that shift? Where, when did you decide, yes, I want to pursue this? Well, I mean, I wanted to work as a lawyer until I had gotten to a point where I had paid off a lot of my loans. Um, so that was, that was the very practical first step was to, um, you know, pay off some of that student debt. Um, and once I got past that point, I really just, I, I wasn't happy practicing law. And I, in much the way that I think Marjorie has to make some decisions that feel risky and feel like not what she's supposed to quote unquote do. That's kind of how I felt about choosing to write instead of practice law. I mean, you know, I was the first in my family to go to college. We did not come from a family of lawyers. I mean, this, it was, it was kind of heretical in a way for me to turn my back on my law degree and say, I'm just not going to use this anymore. I'm going to pursue this thing I've always wanted to do, this thing that I really love and makes me happy. Um, and so it took a few years to actually make that break. I, I went to practicing law part-time for a while. That seemed like a good idea, a good way to transition. Um, in retrospect, I probably should have pulled the band-aid off and just quit um, in one fell swoop, but I didn't, I eased into it. Um, and I, it was absolutely the right decision for me. I mean, I, I don't regret it for a moment. I am amazed at the number of uh, authors that I talk to who are, I, I have no idea what the percentage is, but it's, it seems like a lot. <laughs> That's my very scientific, scientific <laughs> mathematical number, a lot who were either lawyers or journalists. Um, yes, th those yes. tend to, to feed into uh, becoming an author. But from your own journey, do you have advice for aspiring authors? I do. I would say if you are putting words on a page, have confidence and call yourself a writer. I, I, for a long time, somebody, someone would, I would meet someone and they would ask me, what do you do? And my response would be, I'm trying to write which was kind of a weak and wishy-washy response. I mean, if I'm sitting down multiple days a week and putting my heart and, and a lot of effort into writing a story, then I'm a writer. And I wish somebody had told me that sooner, that it's not the publication. It's not, um, you know, it's nice. I'm not going to deny that. Like having a short story or a book published is an unbelievably amazing feeling, but that's not what makes you a writer. And I think the sooner you have the self-conception that you're a writer, an author, then the sooner you your work improves and you have the confidence to put your work out there in the world. Um, I just think it's a mindset that's really important to adopt earlier than publication. Yeah, I agree. I think I think I hear a lot of people say something like that. Oh, I'm you know I'm trying to do this, or I you know I uh, I, I kind of am this, but not really. Um, right. And we all need what's that? What's that Facebook meme? We all need to have the confidence of a of a four year old dressed like Batman. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, I don't know how to do that, but I, I should work on it. Maybe you have to start by dressing up like Batman. I don't know oh, that's there, the first step. There you go. I'll, I'll look into that. Um, when you take the time to read that's uh, for you, not for research, um, authors and genres that you tend to turn to. Um, so I love Margaret Atwood. I've always loved Margaret Atwood. Um, and I, not always, but, you know, since I first read her in my late teens. Um, and I actually prefer her more, I guess you would say realistic fiction, um, her kind of science fiction stuff. I think it's wonderful, but I, I actually prefer her, like The Robber Bride is one of my favorite books. Um, I just think she's phenomenal. Um, I also, I like, I mentioned Paula McLean earlier. I, I do like um, historical fiction. I like Paula McLean's work. Um, but, you know, I think what an author that I come back to again and again, I mean, I, I intentionally try to reread a book of his at least 
once every two years, sometimes more often, is William Faulkner. And I came across Faulkner in high school and instantly fell in love. I, and, you know, in high school, you're trying to be the cool nerd. So I was like, oh, yeah, I like Faulkner. We carry my Faulkner book around. But like, I actually really did. I mean, the it was the first time I read an author where the language literally just left me breathless. Like his ability to work magic with language um, was something I hadn't encountered before. And um, I happened to be in North Carolina the first time I read um, one of Faulkner's books. So I was, you know, near a magnolia tree when I read it. And it, it really, like, I think being there the first time I was exposed to Faulkner, although I know his work is not set in North Carolina, it was more the South that Miami was. And it really kind of um, just set me up to fall in love with his work. Um, and I've carried that with me through college, through law school. Um, I actually, I wrote um, a paper in law school about negotiation in As I Lay Dying. I mean, that's how much I didn't want to be a lawyer and did love Faulkner that I, I actually, my big paper in law school was about uh, Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Um, so I, those are those are three authors that just really inspire me and motivate me and just make me marvel at, uh, you know, what human beings can do with the written word. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a little jealous that your high school was large enough for there to be the possibility of being a cool <laughs> nerd. My high school class was 40. We had 40 kids in my class. Uh, I was just oh, a nerd. Wow. There was no way I could. Be... <laughs> Nobody was going to care if I read Faulkner or not. I was still a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were 5,000 kids in my high school, yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. there was room for the, uh, to try to be a cool nerd anyway. Right, right. <laughs> there's, there's a thousand people in my hometown, so your high school is five times wow. bigger than my hometown. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, so I know you have a website. Uh, if you can share your website and anywhere people can interact with you on social media. Sure. It's Lori McMullen, L-O-R-I-M-C-M-U-L-L-E-N.com. Um, that's my website. And then I'm not a huge social media person, but I am on Instagram. Um, it's Lori McMullen author and you can find me there. Um, yeah. So that's, that's how I can be located. All right. Thank you. And we've talked about a variety of things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to highlight um, during our time together? Sure. You know, I think there's just, uh, just to dig in a little bit deeper into something we mentioned earlier about the book. You know, we were talking about Marjorie and Andy and how he was the love of her life. And um, part of what I try to convey in the book is that I actually think um, had she written that sentence at the end of her life, I think Marjorie would say that the Everglades was actually the love of her life. And um, I sometimes think about my book as a love story, even though it's, it's not a traditional love story. I think that the way Marjorie felt about the Everglades, the way she truly loved it, I, I think the book is in some ways a love story. And um, I just wanted to throw that in there as kind of a parting thought about the book um, because there, there is a lot about environmentalism and, and feminism and activism, but I, I also think it's a bit of a love story. So, yeah, I would agree. I, you know, you, the book ends right as that part of her life is, is starting to, to begin, you know, with her activism, yep. but you can see that she's, she's moving toward that. And a lot of the decisions yes. that she makes are based on her relationship with the Everglades, as opposed to her relationship with any one person. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Lori, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I know you have a busy weekend, so I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about the book and writing and all sorts of things. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you once again to Lori for taking the time to talk to me about Among the Beautiful Beasts, among other topics. Again, if you are a fan of historical fiction or 
um, biography type reading, then you should really check this book out. I, I very much enjoyed getting the the story of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, learning a little bit more about her, why she might have chosen to become such a devoted activist to the Everglades for the rest of her life. And the fact that she lived to be 108 is just amazing. This We, we only get the first, um, I don't know, maybe 25 years of her life in this book. And, and she lived another 75 82 years after that that's amazing so anyway if you are uh, a fan of women's history you should definitely check out among the beautiful beasts because it's very well written and it is it, you, you've got that back and forth so you get some of the suspense from um the 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 later portions of the book juxtaposed to those those flashback portions of the book so thank you to Lori. thank you as always to you my listeners i very very much appreciate you and the time you spend with me each week if you are a fan of the podcast and you have not already done so please take a few moments to leave a review of the podcast so we can get it out to more people who love books as much as we do that can be written it can be starred whatever platform you listen on you should be able to leave a review and i would greatly appreciate it also so if you're not following the podcast on social media, please do so. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whichever platform you prefer, you can find the podcast and then, you know, drop me a line. Tell me what you're reading. Tell me what you have planned for the holidays. Uh, tell me if you have any Christmas traditions or holiday traditions that revolve around books. I would love to hear about that. I hope that you will join me for the next author interview that will be with Matthew Fitzsimmons about his new standalone uh, thriller, Constance. Um, I'll be speaking with Matthew about that and, of course, I'm sure about a lot of other things, but join me for that on Tuesday's episode. In the meantime, if you're done with your Christmas shopping, that's awesome. You go. If you haven't even started, well get on it or make a plan <laughs> or something. I can't, I, I can't judge. Uh, whatever it is, still, even if you're, even if you haven't even started your Christmas shopping, I still hope that your week involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book because reading, I just, I can't, it, it's the best. So, you know, try to get your Christmas shopping or, or your to-do list done, but put on that to-do list, get lost in a good book. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.